Good evening, folks. Um, <clears throat> we're at time, so we are going to get going. Um, we've got a lot to talk about this evening, so we're going to try to be diligent about keeping to our time schedule this evening. Uh, but So the first thing, uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jeff Comstock, a member of the 4 and 7 Steering Committee. And the last several meetings, uh, we've actually not done uh, introductions, um, but because we've got a, a lot of new faces this evening, we are actually going to go around and do introductions so that we can get better acquainted with each other. And uh, so the basic ground rules that we try to manage at our NPA meetings are that we listen to the person who's speaking, uh, we respect the agenda and the process, share your opinion politely, and treat one another uh, respectfully. And so uh, with that, um, Bridget is going to manage the microphone for us, and we'll go around and please introduce yourselves, and then we'll get going. Matt Hurlbert, I am Ward 7 and a member of the Steering Committee. Jeff Clark, Ward 4 and Steering Committee, and I'll be timekeeping tonight. So, and one thing to keep in mind, uh, apologies, but we don't have amplification in the room, so yell into that mic as much as you can so everyone in the room can hear you. Hi, I'm Lee Morrigan, pronouns are they, them, I'm a Steering Committee member. <clears throat> I'm Frank Bosek, and I'm from Ward 4. Kendra Sowers, North District School Commissioner. Monica Ivancic, Ward 7 School Commissioner. I'm Annie Lawson. I'm in Ward 4. Um, I'm Amy Malinowski, she, her, and I'm in Ward 1. Uh, I'm Tyler Pastoric, he, or they, and I'm in Ward 8. Jump rope. <laughs> Cliff Cooper, Ward 4. Ellen Cooper, Ward 4. <sighs> David Kirk, Ward 7. <laughs> Sarah Carpenter, City Councilor, Ward 4. Okay, I guess we are <clears throat> going to get going, and we also uh, try to carve out a few extra. Hello, Ward 4. Oh. Oh, okay, Jeff. You, you, you uh, Jeff, can you manage the folks on on Zoom, please? We'll go next. Bob Hooper. Bob Hooper, Ward Four, State Rep. Olivia. Olivia Taylor, Ward Seven. Uh, uh, steering committee member. Steve Hamlin, please. Steve Hamlin, Steve Ward Hamlin. Ward We have Sam and Adam, please. Adam, if you could um, introduce yourself and the ward you're in, please. We'll go to Margaret. Margaret. Margaret Royal. Ward, Ward five. Ward five. Hi, Sylvia. If you could introduce yourself. Hi, Sylvia. <clears throat> Gotta tell uh, Sylvia. Can you, there you go. Can, you, can you hear me now? Ken, your ward, please. Ward seven. Sylvia. Ward, Sylvia. Ward, Sylvia. Ward seven. Thank you. Adam, we'll try you again. Okay. All right, it's got problems with the mute button apparently. So I'll start. Jeff, Amy. Hi, everybody. Mila Grant, Ward 3, and I also currently serve on the Police Commission. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Mark Barlow, uh, North District City Councilor on Ward 4. All right. I think we made it through the roster. Thank you. Sure, so, uh, <clears throat> Kendra, if you want to come up and get comfortable here at the okay. presenter's okay. table. <laughs> oh, Monica. Yep. Um, so are there any um, announcements that folks would like to make before we uh, get started with the school board presentation? Annie, it looks like you have a question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering, you have, you have some announcements, but I'm wondering, when does public comment happen? Uh, we don't actually have a formal public comment period here. We've Our announcement, community announcement, has kind of doubled. Is that, okay. if there's something particular you would like to add? Gotcha. Please. Yes, it, it would be, yes. Okay, I think we are ready. And, and with that, so... Um, oh. uh, I'm just handing out the one pager. Oh, one sec. Jeff, it looks like Sylvia has something. Oh, okay. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, sure, thank you. Ready? Sylvia, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I put something in the event board forum this afternoon. It has to do with uh, pesticides and integrated pest management in schools, which uh, it would be, I would, could be uh, related to the school budget. And I, it would be interesting to know if anybody talking about the budget knows about the integrated pest management plans at schools. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Have, uh, one uh, new addition, and then I'll uh, keep the microphone off. Can you okay. identify yourself, please, and your ward? Hi, uh, my name is uh, Scott Rogers. I'm a community development manager with CEDAW. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, that's all right. Okay, so uh, yeah, just to... Uh, We've got kind of a dual format uh, this evening. So for this part, we've got kind of this, sort of this standard moderator, and I'm going to turn this part of the presentation over to you and set you off on your own. So excellent, take Thank it. You. Hey. All right, Monica's going to start us off. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, my name is Monica Ivancic again, and I'm the Ward Seven. Um, School Commissioner, I'm also co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee on the school board. Um, so as many of you might know or might not, uh, the school board approved the uh, fiscal year 24 budget on January 17th, so just last week. And for the second time, uh, for the second year under the leadership, leadership. of uh, Tom Flanagan, we are using it, using an equitable budget and staffing model. Um, and this equitable budget and staffing model doesn't have to do with an increased budget or decreased budget. It just has to do with how the pie is cut. So the pie is cut in a, a little bit differently. So more resources go to students who need them most. Um, to do this, we have what we call the RISE allocation, and RISE stands for Recognizing Injustice and Seeking Equity. Um, and to figure out, uh, so uh, there's about $1.5 million that are allocated for this allocation, and we use a weighted student formula, um, and the funds go to schools in, that have more needs. And you'll see on the second page of the one pager, uh, we do list the different schools and how much each school gets. Um, to figure out how much school, each school gets, each school forms an advisory group. And the advisory group is formed of school leaders, some teachers, and some parents. Mm -hmm. um, and then they plan how to spend the school's rise allocation. Um, so you have the money amounts per school here, but you also have listed for the elementary versus middle versus high school how these schools decided to spend this money. Um, we mm -hmm. also, our FY24 budget had some guiding principles. 
Um, we wanted to be uh, responsible, uh, responsive to sta staffing changes, um, sorry, to enrollment changes. So we've had a steady decline in enrollment, particularly at elementary schools over the last 10 years or so. And so we want staffing changes to reflect this. Um, we are definitely limiting budget growth due to the increases in wages, which were about 6%, benefits, Unfortunately, health insurance goes up an ast astronomical amount every single year, 12%. Um, and then there's the BHS BTC costs. Uh, the other thing is that we want to ensure funding to meet the strategic plan objectives. Um, we recently developed a robust strategic plan for the next five years, it runs from 22 through 27. Um, and there's five uh, pillars to this plan. So um, you can find this information on the district website, um, but essentially we involved a lot of community members in developing this strategic plan. So um, we want to also, on top of that, we want to continue to provide robust programmatic offerings and uh, consider multi-year impact of changes and minimize annual disruptions, so not like budget year to year, but look ahead and see what decisions we make now would affect our schools, you know, within the within five years. Um, I will turn it over to Kendra, who will talk a little bit more about the numbers. Okay, good. Um, so again, I'm Kendra. I'm your North District School Commissioner. I'm also the co-chair of the Finance and Facilities um, uh, Committee. So. Education spending and s developing a tax rate, as we know, is kind of complicated. So I just wanted to start with a little um, overview of kind of the four variables that make up our education tax rate, because the school budget is one of those variables. And I'm going to go deeper into our school budget and what that looks like, but I also want you guys to understand what the other variables are, because it's important to know how we came up with what we're looking at as the um, tax rate of 4% that will impact your taxes. And I just want you to understand the difference between school spending and how that is part of the formula and how that um, leads to a 4% tax increase. So there's four variables that go and make up um, the education tax rate. So the first variable is the education spending. That is the one that your school board controls. It's how much um, we spend here in the district. I will go in through that a little bit more. But for this year, we have a 6.5% increase of our school budget at the district level. The second variable is the equalized pupils. So that is a weighted number of pupils that takes into account things like poverty and English language learners. So it might be that one student is counted as like 2.5 if they are English language and poverty. So we have in our district um, 3,702 weighted students. And that's a decline from last year. Monica mentioned we have enrollment is, is decreasing and it's been a trend for a few years. And from last year to this year, we lost 3.5%. And what that means is we just, we get less money from the state education fund for every student that we lose. So that is a downward pressure on our taxes. Another variable, the third variable, is the homestead dollar yield. And that is a, that's a state variable that reflects the amount in the state education fund. So we have a very healthy state education fund, which is wonderful, and that will help to decrease our taxes. And then the last variable is the common level of appraisal, and that's a measure of our property values for each community. And so last year we were at like 100 or just over 100 percent and this year we are down to 95.33 percent means our home values of what we're we're paying is a little bit um they're worth a little bit more than what we're paying in taxes so every year that number goes usually goes down a little bit um, that's an 8.7 percent decrease from last year that's a significant jump down it is in it, it is um in alignment with other di other districts and, and areas in this, because we did look, because we were surprised at that, that number. And that does increase our taxes. 
So you can kind of see how these variables all come together um, and, and create our 4% tax rate. I just wanted to add that last year, remember our properties got appraised. So a year ago for our budget, that CLA increased by a large amount. Yeah, it was over, 40, it was at 100%. Yeah, yeah. so. 45%. So, um, so those are the variables for the tax rates um, to come up with the 4% tax rate, which you have, you're gonna see on this um, one page flyer, okay? Cause that's under the tax impact estimates, which I know is what people are really wanna see. Like, what am I gonna see on my tax bill? Those are the variables that go into it. I do want to point out that um, the equalized pupil count, we are hoping for next year because we worked really hard at passing um, student waiting, which brings more. Um, they hadn't changed the formula in over 20 years, so that should bring more money for Burlington because we serve a lot of students who have high needs. We serve a lot of English language learners and we have a lot of students who live in poverty. So those numbers should change next year in our favor. So, okay, so that's a lot to, to go through, but I just wanted you to have a little bit of a picture of how the whole um, taxes worked on your education tax um, bill. So a little bit, more into our budget and how we came to our budget um, as Monica said there were some pressures that we knew right away wages uh, were up six percent the benefits are, are up 12 percent that's health insurance it's statewide we can't do anything about that um, the BHS BTC borrowing is in this budget that's a super important to know so when we talk about your four percent tax increase that includes the borrowing for this year for BHS BTC. So I just wanted to know, let everyone know that that's not an additional amount on top of your taxes this year. Um, we also have some federal COVID funds that are going away. So we entered this, this budget season knowing that we had those kind of financial challenges to overcome. And um, the school district and the superintendent really took a deep dive into a lot of the programs. They took a look at the trends in, in declining enrollment. They looked at staffing. They looked at resources. They looked at programs at each school. Um, we had the help of an independent firm because we really wanted to look at the data for all of our schools. It's super important. And really um, what the net result of that was was a net reduction of 6.8 staff. So because our enrollment is going down, there was, we, we believed and the district believed a necessity to have our staff um, in better alignment with the declining enrollment. So that happened this year and we also looked at our BHS, uh, I'm sorry, our BTC tuition. So our tech center serves um, a majority, just over half are Burlington students, but we have sending schools that send students to BTC. And that tuition um, has, we, we raised it 18% this year, which is a lot, but we do believe that our sending schools should pay for some of the rental costs of the programs and having it not be shouldered by all of Burlingtonians. So that is also included in this budget. So we were wa trying to look at things that um, we could to kind of um, reduce some of the tax burdens on Burlingtonians this year. So um, with that in mind, um, our budget, as I mentioned, increased by 6.57% this year from, from the previous year. Um, and let's see, of that, of the total amount, if you pick up your little sheet now, I hope this makes a little more sense because this is what I'm in this long-winded way of looking at our budget at a glance. So our total, the total budget is $98.2 million. That's this year. This, that's FY23. That's, that, that's for, right. For uh, next year. Right. This is for next year coming up. Um, and we have increases of the of health insurance wages you can see the debt services utilities and then the BTC borrowing is all part of that so that le all leads to a six percent increase in our budget so the totals 104.1 yep so yeah. this, the total of their school spending that includes federal and state grants which is has not been listed on here the federal and state grants are about six million dollars so you're kind of wondering why those numbers don't add up it's because federal and state grants are added into that number. 
So you look at the 6% and that's our, our budget increase. And then when you take the four variables that I talked about in the beginning of the presentation, you come out with a second chart, which is your tax impact estimates. So using the four variables, um, your, your uh, projected increase is 4.03%. If you are an income sensitized um, taxpayer, we gave an example of somebody who makes $50,000. There's quite a few people in Burlington who are income sensitized. You'll see a 0.07% increase and your taxes will go up by about a dollar. I um, believe that's like 85% of our it's, population. It's a big, it's, I don't know the population, but it's a large, it's a big Sarah, percentage of Burlington. It's about 70%. 70%, okay. yeah, it's a lot. Burlington or these two wards? Burlington, Burlington. yeah. Um, and so that's helpful to look at. We do have additional tax charts um, that we have on our website that you can look at if you are looking to see where your income falls and how much projected tax that you would pay. So I hope that um, is a bit clearer. So um, our ballot, of course, the, the vote is on March 7th. You will be getting early ballots, and I do hope that we can ask for your uh, yes vote for the school budget coming up. And just as a reminder, of the 4.03%, 2.75% of that is related to the borrowing for BHS BTC. So we really tried to hold the line on taxes as much as we could while still providing the students with the resources they needed and taking care of our teachers. So with that, I'm, I'm sure you guys have lots of questions, or maybe not, but I, we wanted to give plenty of time for questions um, to you all. David. So, we need some I, I understand. David, you, you need a microphone? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I understand you have $2.1 million going to BTCBHS um, for the coming year. Um, it, that's in our budget. I'm a little confused. Is that you're borrowing it out of the 165? Yes. So it's almost like your mortgage. You know how you took, <clears throat> if you took out a $300,000 mortgage, but you're not going to, you're going to pay in monthly an amount. Mm -hmm. That's the amount we're paying monthly for the amount we're borrowing this year. So it's not that we're taking only $2.2 million mm -hmm. out of the bond this year. Okay. We're, we're borrowing in a certain amount, and the estimated amount that we pay back monthly okay. is, yeah, great uh, question. I, okay, I understand. So um, are we projecting a, a surplus for the fourth year in a row now for our budget on this budget? So we're going to redirect funds again towards BTCBHS? Thank you for that question, too. Um, the surplus is about $2 million. It's about 2% of our budget. It's what we really like to have. We need a little bit of a cushion. 2% in our budget is a good cushion. We do not want to underfund. So yes, we had about $2.1, $2.3 million this year for surplus that is rolled into this budget already. Right. That, that's was it rolled into the budget, or was it sent and put aside and voted on to move to BTC BHS like the other surpluses were. This one was rolled into this budget. Okay, so we only still have like seven million dollars in surplus for BHS BTC from the past years. We still have what we promised. Yeah. What? Yes. I, I don't actually know five those specific numbers, but million. we have already, I believe, used those for BHS BTC. Okay. Fair enough. Well, and I think um, that's over the next several years while the school's being built so that every year we could pour it into. I'm, just, I'm talking about the surpluses from the past years. Though. Right, because the surplus Kendra's talking about is from FY22. I understood that part. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, can I revisit the, the income sensitized data? Uh, absolutely. Um, I didn't catch it all the first time, time around. So when you said that 85%, is that? 70%, 70. Oh, I was wrong. Okay, is that of the Burlington population or Tax property? Tax population. Taxpayers, Taxpayers, but not necessarily property, property owners. Tax. Property taxpayers. Pro okay, 
right? Right. Right. It taxpayers. Property. Excuse me, because you who own property, they're not paying the property tax, they're paying income sensitized taxes. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was just taxpayer. trying to figure out whether we're actually talking about property taxpayers or all of the taxpayers as part of the prop population of Burlington. So I believe not renters. Yeah, not renters. No, no, I, I understand two, that part. So if there's two separate ways to pay our taxes, right? So yes. By property, right? But if your income is on a scale that's a little bit lower, they do have income sensitized ways to pay in order to have to try to make Burlington more affordable for people who have, I believe that's the reason, to, who have lower incomes. Yeah, I understand. So they pay less. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Sarah? This is on the same vein, and actually, Hold on I'm going to actually ask the question of Representative Odie to take her by surprise, if you're listening, Carol. Um, the, there's been discussion that the income sensitivity formula may be need of updated, particularly in communities with high property values. It's a little bit of a black box to figure it out. Um, and it's a ratio of property value to income. And I'm just asking Representative Odia, do you think the legislature is going to look at that at all this, in this next year? Um, well, I think I think we should look at it. So um, I thank you for bringing it up, and um, and it's it's a it's a I'll 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 talk it around. Okay, I, I just think that's important for a city like Burlington because we haven't caught up with ourselves yet and I actually expect our CLA to drop even more next year so that's just something we need to think about thank you so much Sarah bring it I have a question can I have the prerogative of the microphone okay I have a quick question yes has there been a conversation on the board about the nexus of your school budget and Burlington's housing policy. Is our enrollment down because we are just not making children as we used to? <laughs> or is it we don't have enough housing, appropriate housing, for families to move into Burlington, which would increase our tax base? And maybe I, I could ask Kendra. I could start, and then I'd love some help because I don't really know about birth rates in Burlington. I don't either. But, but I, I will say that um, I know with our, um, our policies on immigration, we had seen a, a declining trend for that for a while now. So that has affected our enrollment. Um, Especially under Trump. Yeah, so yeah. that has been that has that has been down. So for about the past eight years, we've seen slightly declining enrollment and then of course with with COVID we couldn't really look at that data and have it be clean data because some people decided to homeschool and pull their kids out and so the data was really that was kind of those blip of two years um, but we did see from last year where we considered it normal to this year um, we did see that d decline of uh, three and a half percent in our enrollment. And some of it was also high school students. You know, when we went to Macy's, kids, uh, people put their kids at Rice or tried to get them into neighboring districts. Yeah. So, but somebody could speak more on the housing part of that yeah, no, than I, I could. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Matt? Oh. I'd be happy to speak oh. to housing. I'm a real estate broker with 28 years experience. This evening there were nine single family homes for sale in the city of Burlington with a population of 45 to 50,000 people. And three of those nine are $1.2 million and above. Ooh. No, there's not enough housing and no, there is no effort by any stretch of the imagination by any part of the city of Burlington or its zoning department, even though they attempt to claim to make efforts, there's no effort. The effort starts with working with builders and encouraging construction, and there's none of that. So in the okay. school board's defense, yes, there is a shortage, and no, there's no direct yes. solution. Sarah? I was just going to say two things. 
we had an exceedingly low birth rate. Vermont is, I think, the lowest birth rate. In the, in, the, in the state, and I think Burlington is even part. But I, I'll agree with Matt, we're not producing multi-bedroom um, multi housing, which would be attractive to families, and we have a real dearth of home ownership opportunities, which, which, which we might be more attractive. So I think it's the combination. Our market, for better or worse, is single bedroom or one bedroom apartments. We have a city full of 22 to 32 year olds, and that's who's renting. As a little antidote out here, my neighborhood had a couple turnovers. Two of our single family homes, which were high priced, but they sold interestingly as second homes in a residential neighborhood. Mm. So there's, there is um, another little phenomena going over. Okay, we are, time's up for this uh, panel. We still have five minutes. Okay. Yep. And if you uh, are looking at us wondering, what's the buzz? Like, why is everyone talking to each other? It's because our moderator is lost, and we are trying to get her here. So we apologize to Kendra and oh, <laughs> colleagues. Uh, we were, but, um, and to our audience and residence members, but that's the buzz. And take it away. So, any other questions? Please feel free to check out our website. Our website, if, you're, if you want more information about the budget, um, you can go right online. There's a, a link right off of the, the uh, district website called Budget that you can get any more information that you're looking for. And you can always reach out to us as well or any school board member. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Oh. Thanks. Thank you. And if anybody needs a, a handout, let me know. <laughs> so <clears throat> what we're going to do is uh, managing this meeting on the fly is <clears throat> because our assigned moderator <clears throat> went to the Champlain College Miller Center on Pine Street. <clears throat> um, if I may, I would sort of hope that the Free Press reporter would read the fine print on the agenda, but... She is a reporter. I just say it. Um, so if I can invite our um, Prop Zero panelist to come, uh, come up to the pre presenter's table and make yourself comfortable. And in the meantime, uh, Bridget is going to act as our <coughs> stand-in moderator. So thank right. you. Getting, while we're all getting seated, um, Jeff, uh, can you remind folks on the Zoom and the people here, where can people actually read these petitions and these ballot measures? Okay, so the uh, interesting experience, uh, today I actually I did a Facebook post to remind folks of uh, the link, and I tried going to the city council uh, agenda page and that actually didn't work when I posted in in Facebook, so I actually I went back so to the city clerks. Uh, so if you go to the city of Burlington webpage and you pick on the clerk treasurer's office, and then on the sidebar there's an elections tab. So if you click on the elections tab under the clerk's office, uh, down at the bottom of that page there's a, a link to a document that has all of the ballot uh, questions in it, and it has uh, the complete, um, the full, full version, 18 pages of uh, the ballot questions, so it has both the language that will appear on the ballot and the full supplemental language that will be in the voting booth when you, if you go to vote. And quite honestly, I'm not sure if the clerk's office is going to mail this document to everybody that chooses to vote by mail. No. No. Okay. Our city councilors are telling us no. Just last night, we adopted what's called short-form language, and that's what's going to be mailed. We did have a discussion with the chief administrative office, and they said that they would 
Oh, sorry. <laughs> just last night we adopted what's called the short form language. That's what you're going to get with your ballot. We had a, a specific discussion about making sure that when you are mailed your ballot, you have a clear reference to where you can find it, acknowledging that it's not easy to find now. So we'll try to follow up with um, Catherine Shad to make sure that it's clearer and uh, maybe in an easier place on the website because that is something we need. Yeah, but if so, yeah, uh, like I said, I started with the city council page that you had worked on from, but um, that document is, is readily, readily available on the clerk's page now. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh, oh. Councillor Bergman? Uh, I, c I can do that, Charlie. Uh, so just so everybody knows, this is a polling place. So every polling place has to have the full ballot posted on it as well as like the checklist. So they should, at when they get ready, uh, there's a certain time frame. So it's not going to be like now, but it, it will be before the election. They will be posting the ballots and also, I, I, I think, the, the long forms in this building as well. So people will have access without having to drag yourselves down to City Hall, which is very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a Madam question. Moderator. All right. First of all, we have a question from one of our panels. Well, I just want to let you know, if you want to see the petition language for the, uh, the two ballot items that are being covered tonight, um, there are a couple copies on the table back there. So if you like, oh, want great. to go sneak over and grab one, you can definitely do that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, let's start. My name is uh, Bridget Bozek. For those of you who do not meet, uh, need to... Uh, uh, who do not know me. I'm uh, Ward 4, and I'm a member of the steering committee with this group of people. Uh, and I'm going to be your ad hoc moderator. I wish I had done my homework, but I'm not bitter. Go ahead. Um, so we have, a, actually, we have a great panel. Is Bill on the uh, Zoom? Uh, no, Bill uh, succumbed to the weather, so he decided not to travel and apparently hasn't made it on to Zoom yet, even though he was invited to do that. Okay. And our uh, other moderator is stuck in a snowbank somewhere. So uh, uh, we have two panels. This is going to be the first panel. And um, uh, we're going to talk today on this panel about propos what is colloquially called Proposition zero. And uh, Proposition Zero, I'll just read you the three lines. Shall the Burlington City Charter, as amended, be further amended to grant voters the powers to initiate ballot questions, propose enactment, and repeal of ordinances by majority vote, the substance of which is outlined below, and read it for yourselves. Um, we have designed these panels uh, to have four speakers, two supporting the measure to not supporting the measure. Uh, Bill Koff was supposed to be here today. He is, he is unable, as you just heard. And I would like to go down this panel, and uh, uh, starting with you, please, Farid, and introduce yourselves and your affiliation uh, to the petition. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us here. Uh, my name is Farid Munarshia. I am a resident of Ward 5 in the South End. Um, and I am a volunteer with the Proposition Zero campaign. Um, hi, I'm Amy Malinowski. Um, I'm a resident in Ward 1, and um, yeah, I helped collect signatures. Um, hi, my name is Chip Mason. I'm a resident of Ward 5. Um, I, am, I served for 10 years um, on the City Council, was chair of the Ordinance Committee for 10 of those years, which I think is one reason I was asked to come and um, present my view on Prop Zero. I'm not affiliated with anyone other than here um, as an interested citizen. Thank you. Uh, the rules are going to be the following, and it's going to apply <coughs> to both panels. Uh, we're going to start with each uh, of the members giving a four-minute presentation, followed by what I call the two-minute lightning round. Um, I haven't decided what that lightning round is going to be. I could ask the question and give each one of you two minutes to respond, 
or, which I think is probably what you want to do, is ask each other a question for two minutes. But let's, uh, let's wing it. Let's have a good conversation. And Fareed, I would like to ask you to start, please. Um, so I was hoping for a coin toss <laughs> because uh, <laughs> to, to us, it, and from our experience collecting the petition, this is a no-brainer. Like Everybody is like very supportive. Uh, I would say like 95% of the people we spoke to, and we had to gather uh, over 2,000 signatures, like almost like across the board, uh, with the exception of former or current uh, uh, officials, like elected officials. People are in support of this petition. Uh, it's something that's uh, it's one page long. You can uh, read it for yourself. There's some physical copies over there. Uh, we copied like the language of from other cities, other municipalities uh, charter, uh, and this is such a uh, proud tradition of Vermont of having grassroots democracy, of like town hall style democracy and grassroots decision making process. Uh, I would really like to hear about why not, and uh, we I'm kind of like shocked that they were sending Bill Kehoe and Chip like to. Uh, to be on this panel, and uh, I, I want to know, I want to hear what the, the objections are. So I, I'll yield the rest of my time. All right. Well, Wendy, why don't you go second then? Uh, sure. Um, so I guess um, the thing that I would say is that the powers that this uh, ballot item proposes exist in every other municipality around Vermont. Uh, just not in Burlington. And so uh, what is that power? It's the power to propose, amend, or repeal ordinances by majority rules. Um, and for most other places, that's happening through the longstanding tradition of town meeting day. Um, but as Freed mentioned, um, both Burlington and Winooski, like we don't have a town meeting day where we gather an auditorium and we can do this kind of thing, right? We have the ballot. So Winooski in 2015 actually passed this exact same language. It went through, like the voters passed it, it went to the legislature, the legislature vetted it and passed it, and we are just stealing it from them, and we are trying to do the same thing. Um, so what I think this is really about is, um, well, to say what those three powers are, the first one is it enables you to propose um, things that you want to change about Burlington. And I think this is the most exciting part to think about. So let's say you have an idea, uh, something you want to change about Burlington. I don't know what you're dreaming about, but uh, if you run around and you get 5% of voters to sign a petition saying, I think that's a good idea too, which as Fried mentioned, that's about 2,000 voters, um, which is, as someone who has canvassed, a lot of hours. Like, 400 plus hours, it is a lot, a lot of work. So it's not an easy feat. Um, so if you, you do that, then it creates a situation where the city council and the mayor need to respond to that petition. Um, and they can either choose to pass it, yay, or they could say no. And if they say no, instead of it just like dying there, which is the current situation, things would just die, right? Uh, what it says is it gets to go on the ballot and Burlington gets to have the final say. You showed enough of Burlington has interest in this. You put in all this work. There's, a lot of, there's enough interest. We should get to have the final say. So that's the first power, which I think is the most exciting. The second is that you're able to repeal. So this is actually not a new power. We're actually already granted this through the Vermont Constitution. Uh, we're just surfacing it so that people know we have it. <laughs> um, but that's saying, you know, if you, if you didn't like something that got passed by city council, then you could uh, put a referendum to repeal it and have it reconsidered. Um, and then the third one is that you can ask advisory questions on the ballot. So this isn't binding. It's really just like getting a temperature check. So in the past, for example, there's been advisor questions about, um, you know, how do you feel about F-35s, that kind of thing. It doesn't actually do anything, but it allows us to get a temperature check of what our neighbors think. Um, so that's another piece um, that we have access to through this. So um, what I think this is really about is it gives more power to the people, not in a really radical way, but in a proven way that the rest of Vermont has been experiencing for a really long time. And we're just bringing um, Burlington City Charter up into alignment with the charters of other municipalities. Um, so really, in essence, um, I think it's about continuing a longstanding Vermont tradition it's about recovering a proven balance of power, where right now we have more unchecked power compared to other municipalities around Vermont. And it's about giving pathways for Burlingtonians uh, to take action on issues we care about. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to flood the ballot with things, but if there's something that we all really care about, we should have some pathway to, to make it possible if we can prove enough of Burlington really wants something. Yeah. <laughs> 
Did our moderator arrive? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> so sorry. Not at all. I had car trouble, and then I went to the wrong place. <laughs> uh, so, oh, please, please sit. Um, all right, ladies and gentlemen. Why don't you stay for a little while there, Bridget? Pardon me? Stay a little while yeah, for the overlap. See okay. What's going on. I'll get her an agenda, too. Yeah? Oh. You want to just, all right. Oh. So, um, Chip. We're in the middle of our four-minute sort of opening presentations. Yes. I think the expectation, which I didn't know, was to then go to two-minute back and forth. Uh, yes. So they've, well, the, the pro has already gone. Um, <clears throat> thank you for re th – yes. Do you get double the time? I don't think I'll need double the time, but um, <laughs> if I bump up against that, let me know. Um, Thank you, Fareed and Amy, for the explanation. Now that I'm no longer on council, I'll be honest, I'm not as paying as close attention as maybe I was when I, when I was on the council. So that's this is the first presentation I've heard in, in terms of the whys of Prop Zero. Um, and, I, and I think it was helpful. I, I sort of looked at the referendum this afternoon and, and sort of agreed. And, and I think it's – I appreciate the reference to other municipalities and it being done, but our system is a little bit different, and I think we need to acknowledge it. You know, we have a mayor, uh, a strong mayor system, which, you know, not many other of these small towns have. Um, we also have an elected council that, in essence, serves as a check and balance, you know, on the mayor between the two of them. That is different than many of the small towns, um, Jericho, you know, wh where they have that um, sort of town meeting day check on the authority um, of the zoning board. Um, the other thing, which I think Amy was alluding to, that this does change. There is currently an ability to put any advisory question on, but the guidance from by the Supreme Court and the legislature is that you know it is you are required as the council to put that question on the ballot only if it's a power reserved to the voters. So um, I'll use a specific example. The most recent one that came up was City Hall Park. You know there was uh, a group that um, wanted very much to put you know the plans, if you will, on the ballot, put it to the voters. Um, and the council in that determination, because it had that authority, made a determination not to put it on the, on the ballot. And I want to walk through this, what th this proposal would change that, such that anything that was presented to the council must be put on, even if under existing state statute it would not have to. The reason, or one of the many reasons I voted, I won't speak for others, in terms of not putting it on the ballot, if there were very real consequences to delaying that action in order to take a temperature of the voters. We had a construction contract. That was going to be delayed. The numbers were going up. Um, we had a contractor lined up who was threatening to pull out if we did not move forward at that time. And we were also trying to deal with a farmer's market. So I, I appreciate an isolation. Of course, it's a good idea to go and, and check with voters. But I think we need to be mindful that there are very real consequences, you know, to delay. The other new piece relates to, you know, the ability to put ordinances um, through a citizen process directly on the ballot. Let me, and, and I think I, I want to explain the public process that an ordinance goes through before it actually gets adopted, because I'm not sure the public is aware of what I would say is the exhaustive process that we go through uh, as a body. Leaving aside those sort of longer terms initiative, uh, initiatives that I served on that literally took years and hundreds of meetings before something is put forth, whether that's you know short-term rental, all the housing reforms that were just proposed, those went through years of public process and meeting. I, I would be a little fearful about the ability to remove all of that, just put it to the voters and let the voters you know vote on something. Those are exceptional ordinances. The typical ordinance process, any ordinance that's introduced, has to go first to the council for a first read. Assuming it gets through the first read, it then gets referred to the ordinance committee for public, you know, an additional public hearing. Um, it also then has to go, before it can be adopted, has to go back to the full council for a second read and potential adoption. If it's an ordinance that requires, you know, that touches zoning, it also has to go through a separate public process at the zoning um, board, as well as, you know, referral to its own ordinance committee. Um, through the process of all of those hearings, we not only hear from the public, but I think the other piece that's missing is experts. Some of this is, you know, including our own city staff. Um, much of what comes forth 
isn't just because a counselor has an idea or a constituent, it's, you know, put forth by the administration, um, you know, who are really experts in many of these areas after typically a public process where input is sought. So I, I have concerns about this proposal to sort of short circuit all of the authority and the public process that has been built in um, and simply put it on the ballot and let the voters decide I don't have experience. I've never lived in a location that has this direct democracy as opposed to a representative democracy. But as someone who stood for election, you know, multiple times, I, I did feel that I was accountable, you know, for my vote and that I was sort of tasked with representing my constituents. It, it is a challenge as an elected official, sort of who do you listen to and how many people contact you? And it's not as simple, or at least it was not for me, as keeping a running tally and making a decision. I've had more co people contact me in support of something than necessarily that, you know, voted in, in opposite or contact to be in opposition. We all know that not everyone has the ability to reach out and contact us on, on matters, and that has to be factored in. The other piece that I somewhat question is I think the belief is this will, you know, through this process, we will somehow empower ourselves with getting the majority consensus of the electorate. I asked someone to sort of pull, you know, turnout results over the last 10 years to get a good sense for what the turnout has been, and it is not a majority. I mean, turnout has been as low in the last 10 years as 12% and as high as 40% in the middle of COVID. Thank you. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure um, to introduce the moderator for the rest of the evening. Uh, her name, unfortunately, has been misspelt on your agenda, and that is on us. Uh, to my left is Lily St. Angelo. Uh, she's with the uh, Burlington Free Press. She's the Urban Change Reporter. I like the title. And uh, she covers city government, public safety, development, and a myriad of uh, social issues. And she is going to be our esteemed moderator, and I will get out of your hair. We're at the two-minute lightning round. All right, thank you for the patience. I had some car issues. Um, I'm sure everyone can relate to that. Um, so we're at the point where we go back through everyone and we have two more minutes each to maybe touch on things that other people have said um, or to make any closing remarks you didn't get to make in your first four minutes. So we're gonna start with Fareed. And we'll go from there. Um, okay, so I want to address uh, some of the points that Chip raised. Um, this public process that you speak of, I mean, we, we know in reality it's not really public. Members of the public always have problems because they are scheduled during work hours. And if you ever show, show up at uh, any of this public engagement process, we know it's like only people who could afford to miss work to, 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 and like, and, or like that are free during that hours are able to attend. And uh, it's, it, I, I, th I think uh, Chip's point is valid in that like not everybody uh, turn out to elections, but is that because they don't care or is that because there's nothing that matters? Like if we don't have any power anyways, then what, what difference does it make? And that's at the bottom of it to me is about power because we the people have no real power in this city. We elect uh, people who are experts to make the decisions for us, but there is no way for us to hold them accountable. Uh, we have a strong mayor system, sure, but that, what if uh, are we also a one-party uh, government? Like, where, like, the, the city council uh, can pass something, and they have, and the mayor is able to veto. Uh, and so, do we want like that, that much power, especially if the city council is? members of the same party as, as the mayor, that to me seems like a problem. But at the bottom of it is, I, I, I think, you know, um, the NPAs, that's like a result of this kind of grassroots decision-making process with real power. So let's revive that and um, provide some check and balances to our city government. Thank you. All right, and then. Do, I, do I get to respond to that or no? Um, I think we're just doing two minutes. You you get to that respond your in your two-minute minute part. Sure. Okay. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, but they're on one side. I, so I'm trying to figure out oh, how we're, what the do format we're doing Do we want to do back to Chip? Or? Sure. Sorry. Okay, Chip, you go. 
Um, thank you, Freed. Um, I, I hear that a lot, you know, in terms of public does not have an opportunity. I will say that is not my experience as an elected official. Um, I, you know, feel whether it's through the NPA, whether it's through Front Porch Forum, I feel, and I've seen it, you know, counselors are available and, you know, do are contacted by a great number of people. I, I appreciate part of the frustration sometimes is I contacted you, but you didn't do what I want. And my response always to that is I'm always going to annoy someone with my decision because I never am contacted where everyone is in favor of something. And just because I didn't vote in the way that you wanted me to doesn't mean that I didn't hear you, but I had to make a decision. Um, we are not, I was not an expert, nor with all due respect are others on the council. You know, we are all parties who hear from our constituents, from people with knowledge, and then try to make the best decisions that we can. Um, on the accountability, you know, if anyone who's watching, I mean, the last election, you know, mayoral election, the progressives were within 200 votes. You know, the, the council has changed back and forth in the last three years from, and even, I don't know what's going to happen this election, you know, from Dem control to the Prague control. So I, I do feel there is accountability, you know, for each elected official based on the decisions that, that they have reached or made. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Amy, did you want to say? Are you Amy? I am. Amy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> do I get two minutes? Um, yes, you do. Okay. Um, well, am I the last two minutes? You are. Did okay. I get my two back? Okay. Maybe I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, I, <Ghost> go ahead. <laughs> you can do um, it by the Bill Quixote uh, voice. Like, yeah, there we go. You can do that. We can have it. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's no real. Understood. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess some of the things I just wanted to respond to is hearing some pieces around, like, oh, there's so much that goes into ordinances. And I just want to um, re emphasize the point that. Um, Winooski has already gone through this process. It's been cleared by the legislature. There, um, there are processes put in place to make sure that the city attorney is able to review things and get everything clear in terms of legalities before these things go on the ballot. Um, so this is something that is pretty thought through um, and is already in practice and being used in Winooski. And the first thing they did with it was made it so that all residents could vote in local elections. Um, so they're already taking action with what, you know, unless they were able to pass this. Um, and so I guess I also just, um, uh, I think a theme here is this piece around power um, and power balance. And I think the thing that I've continually heard when I, I spent hours <laughs> talking to people on the streets about this um, across the spectrum, really bipartisan, like having unchecked power is not good. It's always good to have some balance of power and um, that this really does give just a pathway when there is something that we're not a, that a lot of people care about, uh, but we're not seeing action taken on behalf of city council or the mayor or whoever, that um, this gives us a path. Um, and so that's something that I think really resonates with a lot of people. Um, and that talking to our neighbors is good. This, this encourages that. I think it encourages our neighborly, deep-rooted, like, uh, town hall democracy that is so celebrated in Vermont. Um, and continues that innovation in terms of how we how we practice direct democracy. Just like first place to really do NPAs, first place to really um, you know implement uh, land trusts from municipality. Like there are ways we have continued to be innovative um, compared to the rest of the nation. This is just one other way that we are doing that, and we're just bringing ourselves into alignment with everybody else in Vermont. If you are a visual person and you're like, I want to see a map of this. You can go to everyonebutvermont.com. Everyone but Burlington. Everyone, sorry, everyonebutburlington.com, and you can actually see a map of you know where all these are in Vermont and what ours is. Thank you. All right, that is that panel. Um, thank you all for joining us. Well, we're going to do a Q and A. Oh yes, that's right, a Q and A next. Yeah. So the rules for the Q and A for this panel and for the next panel. Uh, we're going to go to our Zoom attendees first. Uh, priority will be given to residents of Ward 4 and 7, because this is your NPA, needless to say. And so, uh, Jeff, are there any questions right now? Here's, we have a question from Evan Litwin. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is a great panel. I really appreciate all the speakers. and. Um, bringing attention to this issue. And uh, I, I do maybe think Chip should have uh, an opportunity to say to say something uh, else. But 
My questions are really mostly directed to the pro side folks, uh, Farid and uh, I think Amy, I'm sorry if I misheard. Um, so the two questions I have are, one is um, would the city attorney's office or any other legal entity um, be able to review proposed uh, changes for legality, um, including constitutionality? Uh, I guess that's a concern of mine. And then the second question I have is, could this uh, methodology be used to recall elected officials or change other forms of uh, kind of power dynamics? One of the things that you mentioned was that, you know, the mayor can veto um, a, 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 a vote um, or on an ordinance, and I sort of wondered, hmm, is uh, is this something that could be used to, to recall fo folks or shift power to say um, that, and maybe you did say that, and I, I misunderstood, but you talked about unchecked power, and I wouldn't mind hearing what you think the unchecked power is, so that's a three-parter. Um. Well, go ahead. Do you want to talk go to ahead. the uh, piece around um, reviewing for constitutionality and legality? So, yeah, so the the language of the petition uh, itself actually has a set a role for the city attorney to make sure that whatever is being proposed is lawful. And so you can't propose anything that's against the Vermont Constitution, for example, like if you like uh, have an ordinance that would discriminate on the basis of, you know, like color, creed or, or race or religion, like that's not constitutional, so it's, it wouldn't be lawful. And uh, initially, our hope was like that we would have a city council that would work with us uh, and uh, to, to, to directly answer your question is no, it doesn't have those provisions. We're hoping that the city council could work with us and uh, look at what Winooski is doing so that the the petition process itself is more streamlined. So like before we people can even go out and collect signatures, they will have to talk to the city attorney first and have to be certified uh, signature taker. So you can't just pay like some out of towners to collect you know, a bunch of signatures the, the way the California uh, system works. Um, so Winooski actually has figured out a good system where they, all of these concerns are, are addressed. Um, so, uh, and the, as far as like the recall, this, I don't think this will give the authority for recalls. Um, recall of elected official is something we are definitely looking at. And we found uh, that there was previous effort by Councillor Shannon and Councillor Wright uh, when Bob Kiss won his reelection. They went around gathering petition signatures to change the charter, and we would very much like to uh, pick up that effort, um, and and that would be our next uh, campaign project. Wendy, we've got a second. No. Can I just? I I want to for the public's benefit. I want to explain how an ordinance or any resolution gets introduced, because I think there may be a misunderstanding. What it takes to get something on the agenda is a counselor to introduce it, period, full stop. So I'm a little baffled if there's a proposed ordinance, all it takes is one counselor to introduce that and, and it either gets voted up or down. So I'm not, I mean, I appreciate the privilege and the power of being a counselor, but if a constituent comes to me with something that I, and prepared to move forward, you know, I would do so. Otherwise, I'm happy to make a referral to someone else on the council who may be interested. So it is not a, a, a challenging process to get something before the council. I think the public often thinks there's some vetting process because sometimes there have been controversial issues and people will say, why are you doing this? And it's because I didn't introduce it. I don't have the choice. We Someone else introduced it and we have to act on it. So just want to make sure we all understand how simple it is to get something on the city council agenda. Thank you. We have another question on the Zoom. Margaret Joyle, are you unmuted? Yes. Thank you. I am, I do want to raise though, the issue that I am not a Ward 4 or 7 resident and if somebody else has a question, I would want to yield to them because I I think it's important that people who live in this these wards have an opportunity. Uh, th thank you for that sentiment. That's important. Uh, we'll go to Carol Odie. 
Thank you. I, I appreciate um, the, the, the panel. I agree with um, former uh, city councilor Chip Mason that this is not a good idea for Burlington. I worry about the influence of money in politics. And um, I think that it's it, it would be, I could just imagine um, just a, uh, instead of a deliberative process where there's testimony taking, public hearings made, and votes of the city council and the mayor regarding uh, putting a question before the, uh, the public that um, it could be just um, whoever's got whoever's got um, the money to to uh, to push an initiative might win rather than a deliberative process. So I'm very much opposed to this. I, I think we have a representative form of government and this just to me does not I, I disagree with them. So I wanted to say that. All right, we have one more question I'll take from the Zoom audience. And we have at least one question from the audience. So we only have a few minutes left and it is Ali Young. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for the panelists and for everyone before being here. Um, and I, contrary to Representative Odi, I completely disagree that I believe that this is a great and wonderful idea and here is why. You remember when we slashed the number of the police department through attrition from nearly 100 to 74, you all remember. You also remember that when I brought a resolution to the city council so that we can put this ballot as an advisory ballot to the voters, Representative Chip Mason was also opposed to that. So it seems for those who are opposed to this, what I'm hearing is once you get voted into office, then we're moving the people away from delib any delib deliberative process. If we had proposition zero, then I believe that the voters of Burlington will be able to bring back the staffing level of the police department. This is a great idea and whoever's listening, please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have one from the audience. Could I have your name and uh, your ward? Cliff Cooper from Ward 4. I have a question. I'm not totally familiar with this, but it sounds like the devil is in the details of it. If we have 47,000 people in the city and you're just going out and getting 2,000 signatures, that percentage is 4% of the population? Well, around there, yeah. Okay, the devil's in the details. Yeah. But the idea is you're going out to get a minority to try to do a majority. And I don't know whether that's fair. And I think if you bring it to one of the city councilors, whatever your idea is, if it has merit, I think it has legs to stand on. If it doesn't have merit, um, anybody here can go out and get signatures on any proposition that you want to go after. The trouble is you don't want to bring 180 questions to a ballot. And I can see this thing getting out of control and out of hand real simple. Wendy? Right, can I just clarify? Just oh, the, the panelist's name is Amy. And she's not it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, just to clarify, so it's 5% um, to make it so then the city council and the mayor need to respond to it and address it, either pass, fail. Yeah, who um, makes up 5%? Why isn't it 20 so 5% is what the Vermont Constitution sets as the minimum. Um, and so that's pretty much what is generally used in other parts of Vermont. Um, and so, but I would say, so so two pieces there. One, um, yes, it's only getting that amount for the initial part, but then if um, city council doesn't, you know, they go through the deliberations, they do all of these things that Chip's talking about, they're like, yes, they pass it, great. You know, all the experts waited, whatever. But if they say no, then at that point it goes on the ballot, and then the majority of Burlington, plus 1%, has to say yes. So it, it's not like just anything will end up getting passed. Like, you still need, at the end of the day, most of Burlington to be on board with this and turn out to vote on it. Um, and, and to get 5%, I know that can sound small to some people or big to some people, but as someone who's canvassed, it's like, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. I know there's a couple of more questions, but I'm going to give the next, um, uh, the microphone next to our city councilor, Sarah Carpenter. Thank you. Um, I just want to make 
a distinction that's, I think, important. We talk about, stand up, uh, binding initiatives. Initiatives are broader, like the legal citizen voting. That's very different than putting a fully worded ordinance on a ballot. Councilor Jane talked about the racial um, justice thing. There were 21 items in that resolution that got adopted. That's a lot of work in vetting and subsidence ordinance. Uh, we just used, a lot of our ordinances are zoning, and they're eight, 10 pages each. Withdrawing those or proposing those in a ref, in a voted item is exceedingly difficult. And one of the problems is the wording can't be changed. So it, it makes the ability to put into law complicated. When we pass resolutions at the city council uh, level, we really, we have our one or two or three pages and then we subject to ordinance because there's so much detail. This would allow you to put all of that detail on the ballot and you can't change it if you mis make a mistake. <laughs> you gotta go back to the voters. So it, it would be an extremely cumbersome way to govern. And having had the pleasure or not of doing a lot of zoning housing development ordinances, we just passed one on minimum parking. Um, it was nine pages. It took uh, Councilor Travers tons of negotiation with all parties to get it down to eight pages. That's a hard thing to put on a ballot. Thank you. Um, so let's go back to Margaret Joyle. Margaret, Margaret Joyle on Zoom. Thank you. Um, um, I had a couple of questions. It's my understanding that Winooski, South Burlington, and Barry, at least, all cities that have direct ballot initiatives as part of their charter, all have city councils and either town managers or mayors. Is, is, is that correct? Could one of the panel? Yes. Fareed, could yep. you clarify? Yes. Fried says yes. Yeah. Well, Barry yes. has a town manager. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> South Burlington. So, so my point is that when Chip started, he talked about small towns that have really town hall meetings, but that's not what we're talking about. And none of those cities have gone down in flames, the last I heard. I, I, I think my comment part, since I grabbed the mic, was it, this is not an initiative to take away the city council's ability to do their business. That will still continue. We will still have the need for zoning ordinances and uh, you know project review ordinances and on and on and on. And I think it really is important to remember that what happens here is that the citizens of Burlington gather 2,000 votes, which is, I think, a significant amount of voting residents of Burlington. And that comes back to the city council to consider, to make suggestions about, to review. This is not a, uh, some wild uh, idea where you get a bunch of folks together and we say, okay, this is on the ballot now. That's not how that works. And so I really do think it's important for us to consider what the facts are in Prop Zero and in the surrounding cities who do use it, uh, as opposed to the, um, I think, the fear around it. So that's what I would say. Thank you. And we have just a couple of minutes left, and I'm going to give the mic to Chip because he's sure. been doing the Yemen's work for um, sure. uh, your side of the argument. Just to clarify, I think a few comments and then give sort of a closing statement. Um, Amy made the statement that, you know, if you got the 2000 voters or five, five percent, it would have to be approved by a majority of Burlingtonians. It's actually a majority of those who vote, not a majority of Burlingtonians. Um, and in many elections, fewer than 10 th or 10,000 people or fewer voted in, in general elections. These a lot of these would also be special elections. That's a further which looking at the data on special elections, you know, the, the turnout goes through the floor. 
So just to level set that. Also to address Margaret's, um, I'm not familiar with Barry's um, structure, but South Burlington's town manager is not a direct elected official. He's appointed by the council. So it is a very different system than Burlington's. Um, the last point, and I, I appreciate Representative Odie for making it, you know, what the experience in California has been, which has had over a century of direct democracy, um, is that in, in large part it is run by special interests and, and an inordinate amount of money is dumped into these ballot initiatives. Regardless of whether we have this or not, we've all we've all walked or, or been witness to, you know, the special interest groups that pop up either in support or in opposition, whether it's bike lanes on North Ave um, or City Place, a lot of money gets dumped into addressing the pro or cons of these elections. And I do worry that some issues that we have avoided would not necessarily be able to be avoided and would be, you know, engaged and, and potentially, I don't want to say rip apart, I want to over dramatize, but, you know, further polarize um, the community in terms of pro and con of some of these issues that could be put forth by special interests. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I lied. There's another question from can the we audience. Just, um, have one second to respond to the question about money and politics. That was. Um, can you do it in 30 seconds? We already have money influencing politics. The city through the city council, they are able to put anything they want on the ballot. Like as long as like majority of them support it. So that that is also our worry. Like this is why we started this work. Is we are worried about influence of money in politics. And there is nothing stopping the city council from setting up this like level of like uh, making the city attorney available to review before people even go out and gather signatures. Burlington is the right scale. We're not talking about 20 million voters here. We're just talking about our neighbors. You're good with that, Amy? Okay, one last question. What's your name and your ward? I feel like Phil Donahue. <laughs> there you go. Hi, um, my name is Corey Skillman. I'm not gonna lie, I don't really know what ward I live in. Okay, he says I live in ward two. <laughs> um, but I'm a reporter actually in the area. Um, and I more so have a question for anyone. I don't really care who answers it. Um, somebody mentioned fear of I guess, financial bribes or something. And I'm just trying to understand how exactly that would work and like the fear of money kind of controlling which way this goes, because I don't get that. That was the comment, I think, from Carol Odie. If Carol, oh, well, Amy wants to reply to that. And have you noticed I'm using your right name, <laughs> yes, Amy? <thank> you. <laughs> <laughs> I get so, you know, I was like, in the but moment, 30 I seconds. forgot. 30 seconds. Um, I mean, just, just quickly reply to that. I think what a lot of people are often referencing is like in California, I actually lived in San Francisco for a while, you will have people come up to you and they'll be like, can I get your signature? These are people who are paid to go out and like get paid per signature. And so this is how a lot of money can get entered because if you want to make something happen in San Francisco, then you can just like pay, funnel tons of money into people to run around and get signatures, you'll eventually get enough signatures, right? Um, Winooski is already making amendments and things in place, working with their city council to make it so that um, you can make, cr create criteria around who is a person to get signatures, right? So we can make sure that that is not happening here. So we can make sure that it's Burlingtonians, um, you know, p getting signatures for issues that Burlington cares about and it's not people coming from out of town um, and just like funneling a bunch of money in for whatever special interests they care about. I don't know if Frida's more <laughs> oh, yeah, so remember the DID? This is what the city council came up with. 18 pages of gibberish nobody could understand. So whatever standard you're asking of us, will also apply it to the ballot items that they come up with. Please. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. And that completes this panel. Thank you so much on behalf of all of us, on behalf of Lily and the audience and fact checkers. <laughs> Can I just ask, there was a question in the Q&A chat, and I don't know if it got addressed. It was from someone named Trish um, at 8.08 p.m., and I just wanted to point it out in case it didn't, I didn't hear it get addressed, so. Well, we're, we're to yeah, we're moving on to our second okay. panel. I apologize. Um, we are time constrained. I think there... For, second panel is all, yeah, we're here. We're all here. Lily, over to you. Great. Next on our list, we have a panel on the community oversight of the police department. That ballot item, um, it is specifically about a community oversight board. Um, I'm going to 
read a quick overview of it, but it, there's a lot of intricacies to it that I'm not going to totally get to, but I'm sure our panelists will. So, Could you speak up? yes, is this not? It doesn't project to the room. Just okay. Zoom. All right. So this charter change was petitioned to be on the ballot by the group People for Police Accountability. If passed, it would establish a community oversight board of the police department, which would investigate complaints and handle the discipline of officers, including having the power to dismiss officers and the police chief. Currently, discipline is decided by the police chief, and only the mayor can remove the chief. The police commission, which people may think about when, they, when they're reading this ballot item, um, does not have the power to discipline currently. Um, there are many intricacies, as I mentioned, um, and I'm sure we will, we will get into them. So, um, on this panel, we have Tyler Pastoric. Um, oh, no, no, we don't. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm, I'm on the panel instead of Tyler. My name is Annie Lawson. Annie Lawson. Um, any any other any title to that or um, I, uh, no okay <laughs> you'll say that yeah. um, and we also have Jean Bergman and you two are supporting the ballot item yeah. correct yes, so. okay and we also have um, acting chief John Murad and um, we have Mark Barlow and he is Hi. one of our city councilors of course so um, we will we're going, sorry, we're going back and forth, right? Um, yeah, I think that's so the structure, yes. Okay. I didn't see how it started last time, so. Okay. Each person got four minutes. Yeah. Right. So each person will have four minutes to start with, and then we'll have, we'll go back to everyone and have two minutes to do rebuttals or final comments. So um, we are going to start with. I'll start for us for the pro. Okay. If you're going to choose between us where I'm going to be the lead off. Okay, let's start with Eugene Bergman. And um, let me just say before my time starts that every single charter change, the long form, not only can be accessed at the polling places where they'll post them, but right now at the clerk's website. So if you go to the city's website and you go to the clerk treasurer's office and then you go to elections and then you go to the sample ballot item on the left hand side there, you will find them all. So you can look at them all in bloody detail. Yes, and that's a very good point. I <laughs> thank you. Very good point. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, my name is Gene Bergman. I'm the Ward 2 City Councilor, and I am a former a senior assistant city attorney for the city of Burlington. I did that for 20 years, and enforcement was a prime responsibility of what I did, including work for the Burlington Police Department throughout the entire period. And I want to touch on three areas, fairness, composition and selection, and if I've got time, on why this is needed and it's a good fit for the city. So let me talk with fairness. The mayor and others are wrong in alleging the proposal is unfair and biased against officers. And the proposal in sections 189 and 190 of the charter make it clear that discipline can only be based on the finding of just cause. The listing of just causes is exactly what is in the charter right now. In fact, the board's focus is on the extraordinary abuses that have brought us to this point in the first place excessive force, abuse of authority, unlawful arrest stops and seizures, abuse of authority, no, I said that, uh, un other, un other unlawful acts, and there's an another couple of them. There must be an investigation, and proof has to be brought to a hearing, and that is open and transparent, proceeding just like in court. The accused officer has the right to defend themselves, the input of the chief and other command staff is relevant and can be brought by either the prosecutor or the accused. And there's the right to appeal, the right to appeal to the Vermont Superior Court, who will look at whether or not the accused got due process and an impartial and fair, an unbiased hearing. 
Now, this proposal creates a fair process, and indeed, when the National Association for Civilian Oversight for, of Law Enforcement, NACOL, reviewed the original council proposal that was vetoed, in this regard, it is this, the same. And they pointed out that it was thorough, and they made a couple of suggestions for changes, but not one of them related to the fairness of the process. And they said that many communities that they're working with are actually trying to get to the level of authority that this proposal gives to a community oversight board. My conclusion is that this board um, and this proposal is fair and unbiased. Talk, turning to section, to selection and composition, I believe the mayor and the others are wrong to complain about an unelected board having investigatory and disciplinary powers. First, Thank you. The mayor admitted over two years ago that giving the chief near absolute power to impose, impose discipline under the current charter is an aberration in our democratic system and that we, and it contributed significantly to community distrust and we were likely to face continued disputes over the future of disciplinary actions until the issue is addressed but they haven't been meaningfully addressed in the last two years. And that's why over 2,000 voters petitioned for this proposal. Second, the mayor and the city council selects the groups comprising the selection committee of the board. And, and they also have two of nine positions on that board. And the range of groups selecting representatives for the committee exactly the range that I think that we need. Groups with an interest in civil rights, and disability rights. Uh, there's another <coughs> listing there, but they also need to care about the safety of the city and the fairness of the criminal justice system. I death, just this month. Let me finish by, let me just give my last concluding sentence here. We live in a country, not a bubble, and trust and mistrust are affected by the lived experiences of people everywhere. And that's why black parents have to give their kids the talk. It's something that I never, ever thought of having to do with my two boys. That's white privilege, and that's really why we need to uh, move this forward. I look forward to being able to finish the points that I couldn't get to. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Bergman. All right. I think I'm going to go next. OK. OK, um, and thank you, and thank you for the, having this panel tonight. Um, I want to start by saying I think virtually everyone agrees that we need more police in Burlington, more sworn officers, and we need to reform police oversight so the, the chief does not have sole discretion on disciplinary matters. Um, both of these goals are widely held, and even the Burlington Police Officers Association acknowledges this. Um, I don't support the community control ballot uh, measure for three reasons. The first, I think it's going to work against other measures we have implemented to rebuild the department and may likely worsen the attrition problem we've had. During my time on the council, I think we've had broad support for rebuilding BPD, including increasing the sworn officer cap back to 87, creating retention and hiring bonuses, when we ratified a new contract this year, and we approve regionally competitive salaries. But economic measures alone are not sufficient incentives. The employees at BPD need to know that they are not at a greater risk of losing their job or career over a complaint or incident in Burlington than they would be working for other law enforcement agencies in the state. I, I've said this a lot about a lot of issues, but Burlington is not an island. <clears throat> and in this case, law enforcement professionals have choices about where they work, especially in this job market. I'm not fear-mongering on this. This is just a basic fact about risk versus reward behavior in a job market with lots of opportunity. And I've heard this sentiment when I've talked to current and former employees at BPD. The rebuilding effort will slow and attrition may increase if a community control board as defined in the ballot question becomes a reality. Which brings me to my second reason I, I'm against this proposal. The community control board as specified on the ballot will be, giving will be given broad jurisdiction and will prevent uh, people with law enforcement experience from serving. The proposed control board will have the authority to, and I quote, review and make findings on any incident or complaint against an officer, unquote, and discipline or remove the officer when they are, quote, found to have become incompetent, inefficient, or incapable from any cause, is or has been negligent or derelict in their duty, 
is guilty of any misconduct in their private or official life and for any other just cause. And that's pretty broad. The ballot measure also states that no member shall have ever been employed by a law enforcement agency. Think about that for a minute. I served on the school board for four years and we always had people with a background in education serving on the board. Their perspective was especially valued when making decisions impacting our, our schools and teachers. Other professional oversight boards don't have this exclusionary provision either. Excluding people with relevant professional experience excuse me, from serving on uh, this board, especially with the broad discretion the board would have, only adds to the concerns I have about this proposal. Lastly, um, my third reason is that we already have a police commission whose role has been expanded and could be expanded further with ordinance and charter change to allow for greater disciplinary oversight. The simplest solution is often the best one, and rather than having two bodies with overlapping responsibilities for police matters, a commission and a separate control board, we should instead make the changes necessary to allow the commission to take on this greater role. It is less complicated and likely less expensive. We passed a resolution uh, that began this work back in November 2021, and proponents of this ballot measure might argue that we have not moved fast enough. And I'll agree that the process has taken longer than we intended. But the process outlined is still the best approach to achieving the community oversight goal without jeopardizing the BPD rebuild. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, now I'll turn to Annie. Yes. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, everybody. My name is Annie Lawson. I'm a resident of Ward 4, and I've lived in Burlington for 10 years. I am a community member, a social worker, and a mother of a toddler. I got involved with this issue for many reasons, but the main ones are trust and safety. Trust and safety. I believe trust between a community and its police is imperative for a safe community. An objective oversight board for police is an important part of rebuilding trust in our city. This is not a radical idea. In fact, all other high stakes professions are governed by this kind of structure, including mine. As I said, I'm a social worker and I provide mental health counseling to individuals and families. My work with clients begins with building trust. I start every session with a new client by explaining to them how I am governed by an objective oversight board. I'm accountable to the Office of Professional Regulation within the Secretary of State's office. I explain to folks what their options are if they experience any kind of abuse or misconduct by me. I tell them how they can file complaints. This is something that I am legally required to do, but I'm also happy to do it because I feel that it is critical to establishing a relationship of trust. Therapists have a lot of power. We support folks to process some of the hardest parts of their lives. We support them to work through experiences of abuse and trauma. We sit with them in their grief and their loss. We sit with them when they live with thoughts about suicide. Unfortunately, some therapists, in very rare cases, do abuse the power and trust that clients place in them. People who experience this kind of abuse can go to the oversight board, who investigates and, if necessary, determines appropriate discipline for the offending therapist. And I make sure Clarence clients know about this oversight board, and so I think they feel more comfortable placing their trust in me. That trust is absolutely necessary for me to be successful in my work. The same should and can be true for police. People call police in moments of crisis when they are at their most vulnerable. They need to be able to trust that the people who respond will not abuse the power that we bestow in them. And police need the community's trust to be successful in their work. In my role, I use words to do my work, and people trust that I won't use this tool to cause them harm. The tools that we give police officers, weapons, guns, are lethal tools, and we authorize them to use force in their work. As someone who works with words, if I am accountable to an independent oversight board to protect the rights of the people I work with, shouldn't a police officer who uses a gun in their work where the stakes can be lethal, shouldn't they be accountable to the same kind of oversight board? In 2020, when body cam footage showed an officer abusing his authority, city leaders agreed he needed to leave the force, but the current city charter prevented this. So the best the city could do was pay him to resign to the tune of $300,000 of taxpayer money. And the mayor himself acknowledged that the charter is a real problem. Jean quoted, and I'll repeat, the mayor said, such monopoly of important authority is an aberration in our democratic system. We are likely to face continued disputes until this issue is addressed. But that was two years ago and we have still seen no action from city leadership to address this problem. 
When my daughter enters Burlington School District, I will be able to trust that her teachers are accountable to the school board. And to any parents who are listening, I would ask, would you place your trust in a school that refused to be accountable to an oversight body? What about a daycare? A therapist? How about a police officer? Asking the police to engage in this step toward rebuilding public trust is completely reasonable, and furthermore, it is productive, and it will increase the overall safety of the community. For instance, let's say you are out of town and your neighbor sees somebody trying to break into your garage, but they don't feel that they can fully trust the police. They are not going to call the cops. But when the whole community feels like police can be trusted, the entire community becomes more safe. This is about neighbors feeling safe enough to reach out for help when it's needed to protect and take care of each other. That's what community is about. This community needs a community oversight board to repair the trust and to increase the safety of our city. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Annie. Um, now we'll go to Chief Murad. Thanks, and, and thank you for putting this together and everybody for being here. I know that there was a lot of work that went into to this night and this panel, and here we are in a big snowstorm and everybody's here. Um, I, I could talk about the deficits of this petition, uh, the lack of professional experience as a component, the notion that oversight boards of therapists have therapists on them. I could talk about the fact that it is not objective oversight that is planned by this. I could say that there, uh, the notion that there hasn't been any action since 2020 is untrue. There is a, mayor ex a mayoral executive order. There's a strengthened relationship uh, in two different documents with the police commission. Uh, we are more transparent than ever. Um, I could talk about the layers of existing oversight that exist, uh, the, the multiple ways in which officers do have oversight through the courts, uh, through the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, um, through the mayor and the city council. I could talk about the existing process for complaints and the ways in which we are incredibly transparent about these and in which we facilitate people to make complaints, even though they only make about 45 of them a year and about half of those are in valid on their face because they're for places like Burlington, Iowa, or they are clearly mental health issues. But the fact of the matter is that the most pressing problem is not officer discipline. It is not an imaginary horde of dangerous cops who are going unpunished, although, you know, that's where just about 100% of this debate has been. It's not 45 complaints a year, half of them been valid. It's not about uses of force where we make them fully public, nor disparities that we confront and address when, we stem, when they stem from officer actions. The most pressing problem is a collective community failure to provide outcomes and support to the population that needs it, and a community oversight board doesn't do anything to address those. I arrived in Burlington in October of 2018, and, and part of what brought me here, in addition to wanting to come home where I was born, was a reasonable reform-oriented, ahead-of-the-curve police department. We had body-worn cameras, ComStat, Perf iCat, which is a de-escalation tool, and the ERV, that big uh, emergency response vehicle. We'd reduced traffic stops and eliminated the disparities in those in the past two years. These were all in, uh, hallmarks of a, of a cutting-edge agency. In my time as chief in the past two and a half years, closing in on three, I I've kept all of that going, except for ComStat, I regret to say. Most notably, I've expanded our already tremendous data transparency. But let me tell you that this is not what we need to do over the next five years. These are things we have going that we're working on hard. Over the next five years, we need to rebuild this police department, and the mayor and I are starting to deliver on that. We're starting to feel real momentum on that. Unreasonable reform will significantly damage those efforts. What we really need to do is address the needs of the community that we're serving. And it's not about police reform or oversight. It is much, much bigger. This is what, about our need to, to do as a community for the people who need help and not uh, who, those who are affecting our community in ways that we know are not good. We log about 25,000 incidents a year. And I'm working on distilling some of this, but I don't have a data analyst. But there are maybe 400 people, about a percent, 1 percent of Burlington, who cause a vast, vast number of those 25,000 incidents. Here's one. There's a 34-year-old white woman. She's got 304 Valcor incidents, 50 of them since July of 22 alone. And before that, there was a six-month lull only because she was held somewhere. There's, these are calls like assaults and trespass. There's 30 trespass notices in her file, meaning just about every downtown business uh, has, has trespassed her, but that's relatively meaningless on paper, welfare checks, disorderly conduct. And what I know is that as a cop, and somebody who used to be a street cop, it is frustrating to respond to the same person again and again. Addressing her and others like her is what's next. Police discipline is not the problem, and it's irrelevant to this person. What has to be next has to be a more systemic 
effort. And even the crisis team that I'm hoping to build, not fast enough, I admit, isn't enough. We need a new Comstat, and not for opioids, but for this collective community failure that has everybody on board, BHA, uh, DMH, the Department of Mental Health, COTS, STEPS, Howard, the University and the Medical Center, Fire and EMTs, the state's attorney, the mayor and legislators, and yes, even cops. We need caring resources that I know we have in this community to work together to deliver those outcomes that I hear the community wanting. This is not a tool for that. This is a tool for diminishing what we have built and what we are on the cusp of rebuilding and the momentum we have, and it doesn't address any of these issues. Thanks, Chief. All right, now we go to the two minutes um, each for a rebuttal or any other comments you'd like to make. So we'll go back to Councillor Bergman. Thank you. You know, I agree with the Chief on a number of things. Uh, not just now, but regularly. I voted as such. Um, so I agree that we need all these other supports. There's not this contradiction between them. I would also say, and I speak as a real proponent of this, because I think it is necessary, but according to NACOL, it's really important that we don't think that this is a solve-all an overarching solution to every problem we have around public health and safety. So I don't disagree with that. In fact, I have supported all of these efforts to recruit and retain, to get the new resources, mental health and other social workers, and I will continue to do that. But what I said about the Kathy Austrian case, which I cut and pasted today and what I, no, from the Melly case, from the Grenion case, from the Brunel case, from the Bennington cases, is that we have a serious problem with distrust. And unless we deal with that, with an oversight body that is independent and is based in this community, then we will not get to the level of support that will allow us to fully do everything. And I'm glad if there are a f only a few of these um, incidents, but they're important. And I would defer to Commissioner Grant, Milo Grant, who's here, who can talk about the relations with the, um, with the commission and the administration, because I don't really think that they're that rosy, and I don't think that the numbers in terms of the disparities uh, and the other issues that we've got um, have been as solved as, you know, it, as nicely as the chief has said. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Councillor Barlow. Uh, thank you. I just, I don't need two minutes, I don't think, but I just want to emphasize that I'm not against oversight. I'm just not for an independent board other than the police commission to provide that oversight. Um, and so I just want to make that distinction. I do think there is reform to be made. Um, in how we do uh, disciplinary oversight. I just don't agree with this entity as um, the place to vest that authority. Thank you. All right, we'll go back to Annie. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to address some of the, the things that uh, my representative and the acting chief have, um, have raised. Um, first of all, um, Chief, you raised that the social workers and therapists are not um, allowed to serve on, on the boards that govern them. I would question that. Uh, social workers are in an advisory role, and ultimately the people who investigate uh, complaints are housed in the Secretary of State's office, which is not um, uh, full of social workers. Um, the other point I would raise is that um, this is an opportunity, as, as Jean said, this is an opportunity to repair trust. Other accountability bodies may allow um, folks from within that profession to join, like the school board. The, the challenge about applying that idea to, to this one is that if you are really dissatisfied with your school board, you can put your kid in a different school. If you, I use myself as an example, if you are really dissatisfied with your therapist, you can find a new one, but you cannot just um, choose another law enforcement system to engage with. And so because the structure of policing is so unique, we can't just choose to step away from it. We can't just you know, decide to be um, uh, uh, exempt from those expectations. 
because that system is so unique, the oversight system needs to be just as unique. And, um, and, and if a body is full of folks who are being investigated, it's not going to repair trust. This is an opportunity to do that. Uh, lastly, somebody had just uh, something about the police commission and then saying that that should be sufficient. I will note that members of the Burlington Police Commission have resigned in recent years, citing the lack of teeth in the commission as the reason and stating that they're not willing to be part of a body that looks like it is providing oversight when it does not have any actual power. And I'll quote someone who resigned for this reason. They said, at that time, it was my opinion that the police commission was an apparatus that just served to present a perception of oversight. And I would also invite folks, um, as Jean said, to check in with Milo Grant, who is a current and acting member of the police commission. And Milo, is it accurate to say that you endorse the oversight board? Yes. Which is a change for me. My position has she doesn't have a microphone. Oh. Well, uh, Milo, let's let's wait until the uh, okay, panel is over. Yeah. I just want to say that I we are times. Yes. Sure. Thanks. Time's I just wanna, up, but yeah. The um, this is someone outside the board of uh, the, the police commission saying it should be sufficient versus people within the commission saying no, it's not. We need more. All right. So we'll go back to Milo later. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is my first moderator experience, so <laughs> yeah. All right, so have we, we'll, have we had the two minutes from John no, Murad? Murad, yeah. So we can, we we're we're back to Murad. <clears throat> All right, Chief. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, I, I don't think that anybody believes this is a solve all, but it is a, I believe that it would be a harm. I believe that this would be harmful. Uh, I think that there are opportunities for uh, continuing to evaluate oversight. We've been making them over the past two and a half years. We can continue to do so. This is a very narrow and very specific definition of that. And I think one of the challenges, and, and, and frankly, uh, something that I see possible is that uh, a well meaning and uh, overall, uh, you know, progressive oriented public is going to read a ballot item such as this and say oversight community oversight that sounds good to me without understanding the real specifics of this and I think it's in the details that we run into a problem that is not really meant for this community this basic plan was presented in 2019 it only garnered three votes on the City Council at that time uh, the world obviously shifted in 2020 um, and it became something that was uh, reevaluated in uh, 2021 it was vetoed by the mayor and now we have it on petition. Um, I think that uh, we are looking at something that has been looked at by the public and the public has seen issues with it in the past. Uh, I certainly think that there is going to be a, uh, a, a, an impact on this momentum that we currently have with regard to rebuilding the police department. Um, I don't want to diminish that, uh, that, that momentum. Uh, I want to also note that I think that the notion of, of social workers that my uh, panel co-panelists made actually sort of is my case that, that that you can have those professionals on boards and this one specifically prohibits that and the prohibit the prohibition is is such a, a prohibition that actually indicates that there uh, the board is meant to be comprised of a philosophy that ultimately isn't about public safety is an afterthought even in the ballot item itself um, and uh, I think ultimately there are ways we can continue to move forward as a community we've been making, I think, very good progress. I've been incredibly confident over the past couple weeks about where 2023 is going to go. Uh, this is, is something that, that changes that sense and that momentum. So we're going to um, uh, uh, move a little bit away from the rules uh, because I know that Milo has a few things. But Milo, I will ask you two minutes because we are now bumping up and we have a bunch of questions from wards four and seven. With all due respect, I will need a little more than two minutes. You have two minutes, Milo, because we so are almost done. you're not allowing me to speak at all if it's gonna be more than two minutes. I'm asking you, I'm asking you two minutes. Um, and I'm respectfully saying I'm gonna need a, I'm, I'm not gonna just go on and on. Okay. I, and, and you'll have your chance, sir. I'm not no, going to take no, away no, that no, opportunity no, no, for no, you. No, the, the time that you're wasting no, arguing you're with me over time, what is going on here? What is going on here? What is going on here? We could take a little more time. Okay. We can stay. Okay. Then why don't you allow me to speak? All right, Mila. I'm going to talk about the complaint process and I will use that as an example. If you 
have a complaint about a use of force incident or anything that you deem inappropriate and a problem with a police officer and you file that complaint and that complaint goes to our police commission for discussion and we determine that there were policies and procedures violated, we cannot tell you. That is transparent as mud. There were many other inaccuracies that Acting Chief Murad just mentioned. I was not initially for this. I went to meetings, I participated in the conversation, because I like to get out into the community and see what people are talking about. And there's no question in anybody's mind that public safety issues are extremely important to everyone in this city, including myself. But what we have here, despite some advancements that we have made in oversight, and despite the training, and best believe, people can be trained in matters of oversight, and they can bring other things to the table other than being from law enforcement. Anybody, please reach out to me, Milo Grant at gmail.com, and I'm happy to engage you in the conversation. It is clear that the mayor does not have a clue on how to proceed. He is stonewalling. The chief does not fully support the goals of the commission's time for oversight and what the commission is trying to do. And because I have to follow rules about executive sessions and what I cannot talk about and I can't, I'm not allowed to reveal, the mayor and the chief have both participated in giving information to the public that is wrong. Thank you. We have uh, five minutes. We're going to take more questions from the audience. Who's from Ward? Can I just ask? Can I, can I just ask? It looks like Milo Grant is walking off, and there are rep there. Are residents here of Ward 4 and 7 who would like to ask questions. I wonder if she wants to actually hear the questions that we have to ask or if, she, have, wants to, if she yeah. wants to walk off. Thank you. She wants to get food in the back, okay? There's Thank food in the back and all she did was grab a samosa. I didn't run away. That's all right. I just, you know, it looked like it. I'm on Zoom. You win. You win. You win. You win. We've got five minutes. We probably could get a little Ooh, more time sorry. in five minutes. So. Cliff Cooper from Ward 4. I'm just kind of confused. It sounds to me like you want to get rid of the police commission and put in another governing board, or do you want to in elevate the police commission and not have a need for an oversight? I don't see the, the personal need. You, You're talking about 9 to 12 people on that council. There's how many people on the uh, police commission? Seven. How many? No, but how many is seven? Oh, seven. seven. So you're talking about seven plus nine is sixteen. If the members are right, to, as an oversight to a police force of sixty-eight, I think you're. Um, so, so Cliff. I don't get. It. Yeah, I, I understand that you don't. So let's be be clear. If there is much in terms of oversight beyond discipline, right? Everybody, I think, would agree with that. There is monitoring and auditing approaches what are the policies what is the training all of the operational things but at a high level the the review of the reports and how things are doing all of that under this proposal i got it here would will still stay and would stay in the existing police commission all this does is it carves out the discipline process and creates a Seven, mem seven to nine member board to address that. And well, I, I, yeah, yeah, the answer, well, you need a charter change regardless, but it's my position, right? And people, honest people can, can disagree that the monitoring and the auditing work is sufficient 
to take all of the commission's time, which is all volunteer. The other thing about it is it creates familiarity biases. When you get close to people, and I know I worked with the city for a really long time. I love a lot of officers, right? I worked for them and defended them in court against accusations and assorted things, right? You get familiar and that leads to a certain amount of bias. I personally think that having an independent body just to deal with the discipline is the appropriate way. It, it is not, there, there are many ways to do it. NACOL says that we need a best fit approach for us and for every community, not a best practices approach. I happen to think something that has two bodies, one that's focused on discipline, one that focuses on the other, makes the most sense. And I see my time is well up, but it's a compli this is complicated stuff. And I, I totally appreciate the question, but the devil is, is okay. in the details. Thanks. We have a question on the Zoom audience. Deb uh, Belton. I hope I've got that name right. You did, actually. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say I'm really torn on this issue um, a lot. I agree with uh, Chief Murad, and, and I think you should be the chief, so that's what I'm going to call you. Um, you know, and everybody else, I mean, mental health has to be a priority. Um, and I also agree that public trust is really needing to be restored. Um, and I have a problem with the proposed uh uh, commission or whatever we're calling it would not have a representative of the of law enforcement on it. I think that's a that's a a huge uh, shortage. Um, but I feel like if the process, if the if this proposed panel is is corrected in my mind to include some law enforcement on it, um, to make it clear about an appeal process, to grant officers the right that to appeal that they feel confident in whatever. I frankly don't know that I would want a police officer who wouldn't want to be on the force because of that. <laughs> you know, so I mean that that's one one thought. Um, but but I guess I would address um, the chief uh, question to you, which is what has changed in terms of discipline, um, firing ability, whatever, since these incidents have really come to light. Um, not what the proposed plan is, but what has changed? Sure, thanks. Get more power to discipline. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, so yes, there've been a number of changes. I think uh, first and foremost, we created in June of 2020, uh, the most comprehensive and uh, progressive use of force policy for the state of Vermont. Um, and that ultimately was actually adopted by the rest of the state as a statewide use of force policy. It talks about a number of things that weren't in the former use of pol uh, force policy. And whenever a directive has those tools, it gives credence and lends additional ability to any oversight personage in this case, the chief of police, to say that those tools were uh, were violated or were not performed properly. I think there was, you know, uh, Council Bergman mentioned a horrible, horrible, evil incident uh, that occurred in Memphis. And those officers have been fired because the uh, chief of police had tools around excessive force, around duty of care, around uh, duty uh, to intervene, and was able to use those to, to fire those officers. We have those tools now and did not before. Uh, those tools also okay. exist in the state use of force uh, policy that was largely cribbed from the one that I wrote with the police commission in June of 2020. Uh, that's one mechanism. Another mechanism is the mayor's executive order. Uh, that is from September of 2020. It outlines uh, a review practice uh, for him. It, I also report to him on every single use of force that is, uh, to which a person of color is subject. Um, there is a much more elaborate uh, document that guides our relationship with the police commission around all citizen complaints, not just uses of force. That came from August of 2020. Uh, in August of 2021, the uh, police commission and we agreed to release body cam footage proactively. And and just today, I did it for the very first time. 
Uh, we have a redaction specialist now, which allows us to keep up with the volume of work. I released the very first use of force in January 2023 that applies to this. It's a use of force that involves the use of tools, that is firearms being pointed, and we're putting that proactively. No other agency in the country, I believe, does that. Uh, and that is something we're doing. We make every use of force public uh, through report as well, and now a select number of them will be made public via body camera. Those are just a handful of the things that we're doing that are indicative of a of a changed posture on oversight and collaboration and transparency for the public so that it can see how we address these and how we discipline them. Thank you. Okay. And you can fire, are you, I don't know if the police- uh, Yes, okay. I can, and I have fired police officers. We're going to wrap up this panel. Uh, it is nine o'clock. The Robert E. Miller Center is uh, pretty uh, uh, stringent on that. Lily, thank you very, very much. We appreciate you coming down here. We appreciate all the panelists who came, panel one and panel two. Thank you for all of you who have, you know, come out in this snow. Sorry, Annie, I'm wrapping it up. And if you need the petition language, you know where to get it. It's the uh, details are in, the devils are in the details. But thank you very, very much. And uh, this wraps up our NPA meeting. Okay, can I just ask for people who are ward residents who didn't get the opportunity to ask questions during this panel, but Milo Grant, who's running for city council, who doesn't live in this ward did, where would be the best way for us to send emails? What would be the best way for us to direct questions for those of us who did not get to speak on this very important Topic. Thanks. Thanks for raising that. That was actually the point I wanted to make. It seems like there's a lot of participants on Zoom. I would love the chance to keep talking about this because it's a really important question. It deserves more than, you know, uh, 10 minutes, uh, 40 minutes of time. I'll take a maybe questionable move and, and give out my email address and encourage people to email me directly uh, with questions. People can also look up um, information. Uh, Jean, I'll let you give our website because I'm having a, I'm having a. Um, Thank you. Peopleforpoliceaccountability.com. It's all one word. Peopleforpoliceaccountability.com. If you want to email me, I'm a member of this community. It's maybe a risky thing to do, but send me an email. You're my neighbors. I want to talk to you and answer these questions. My email is annie.elizabeth.lawson at gmail.com. I'm going to trust folks are going to use that wisely and just respect um, me as a community member and a neighbor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and also, you so you can get me and Mark, if I could be so bold, is at uh, so I'm G Bergman at BurlingtonVT.gov, and Mark is M Barlow at BurlingtonVT.gov, and are you the same? Mine's on the yeah, no, not, you, and not, I'm not BurlingtonVT.gov. Right. Uh, I'm BPD. Uh, VT, uh, bpdvt.org uh, every single one of those letters sounds the same and makes it hard to hear but right. uh, th that is available right. online at the Burlington website so yeah so uh, please ask questions uh, Deb I'd love to answer your question in terms of that uh, that piece there and talk to you about my father-in-law but uh, that's another that's another subject